Hello, and welcome to Physiological Psychology. My name is Benjamin Miss, and today we're going to be talking about vision and the systems involved. Let us start by looking at what we've recently covered in terms of anatomy. Remember that anatomy is an incredibly important starting point, and if we don't have a good grasp here, it can affect all of our performance from now on. So which part of the brain do we think of as the switchboard or relay station? Kind of the central processing everything goes through here. Would it be the basal ganglia, the frontal lobe, the hippocampus, or the thalamus? And the correct answer is the thalamus. This lobe is most associated with vision. Would it be frontal, parietal, temporal, or occipital? Well, I hope you know this for today because what we're talking about is going to be mostly taking place in the occipital lobe and some associated sensory structures. This part of the brain regulates hormones and controls homeostasis. Would this be the thalamus, hypothalamus, hippocampus, or amygdala? And the answer to this one is the hypothalamus. Below the thalamus, directly connected to the pituitary gland, it controls our body's natural processes in terms of things like blood pressure, heart rate, and body temperature. Very important control center. Well, we're getting into our discussion of vision. And so the main ideas we're going to cover are the structure of the visual system, pathways to vision, the thalamus, the occipital lobe, and the interpretation. So what we're looking at is a number of things involved in where things travel. And so we want to remember this. So even though we're talking about the occipital lobe, the pathways are going to run through the thalamus. Let's start by taking a look at the kind of big picture of where in the brain we're talking about. By size, the temporal lobe, the, the occipital lobe, excuse me, is fairly small, yet almost entirely dedicated to the process of vision. The first image here shows the whole pathway. And from now on, we're going to think of the eye as effectively part of the brain because the eye contains neurons that do early processing. Just in the same way our nerves throughout our body contain neur neurons and do some of the same things our brain does, our eye is already starting to process the information in the world around us. It's going to travel along the optic nerve. This is cranial nerve two, see the little number there. The parts are going to cross at the optic chiasm and then travel to the back of the brain. And one of the things we should know right away about this pathway is that it's really interesting about the way that these things cross. And we'll look at this a number of times. So you see how one eye has blue lines coming off of it and one eye has red lines coming off of it. And then when they cross, some blue lines are on the left and some are on the right and some red lines are on the left and some are on the right. What we're looking at here is we have these two pathways, right, from one pathway from each eye. But when we get to the back of the brain, we only get left or right. So everything that I see over here is processed back here. And we're thinking, well, does that mean my left eye is processed by my right hemisphere? And that is no actually, because it's not about the eye, it's about the visual field. So if we draw a line right down the middle of our visual field, right, everything over here is processed here, and everything over here is processed here. And again, we're looking at well, what about the eye, right? Why not just cross one eye to the other side? Well, the reason is if I close my left eye, I can still see over things over here, right? Even if I'm looking straight ahead here, I can still see things here, which means my right eye is getting quite a bit of my left field of vision. So that's the idea. Within your eye, it's going to split up left and right, and it's going to shunt those to the opposite sides of the brain, basically to the contralateral thalamus. The contralateral thalamus, the opposite side, right, contralateral, the thalamus being the center, right, where everything runs through, and then you see these big tracts running to the occipital lobe. In particular, there's one structure in the thalamus called the lateral geniculate nucleus, that is responsible for processing visual information. Now, the next image we see is the side of your brain, right? And what we're looking at here is where the occipital lobe is. It's all the way in the back, 
it's above, uh, I should say, superior to the cerebellum. And on the other image, where you see the, the red part being the occipital lobe, we see that what we're looking at with that image is this <coughs> facing forward, we're looking just at the back here. All right, so we're looking just at the back of the brain. And that's how we're processing. We start by looking at this very old paper. And this paper was published in 1917, where a medical officer during World War I had a really interesting observation. Now, this is still, people were still trying to figure out what was, how the brain was working and what was going on. And what happened was they saw that this, you know, Riddick realized that patients who had serious damage to their occipital lobe and couldn't see anything were sensitive to vision sensitive to movement and so when we think of our senses we think of our five senses and we probably at this point in college you make fun of the idea of five senses because you're like no I have more and we're not talking about being psychic we're talking about how our senses are kind of like generalities vision contains a lot of components that can work separately that can change our perception and when it comes to movement movement and the perception of movement can even be thought of as maybe a different sense than our conscious perception of vision. If you hear, uh, if you see a movement out of the corner of your eye, right, and it happens really quickly, and you just kind of like go like that, you're moving, you're looking before you've actually processed that there's anything there, right? You're not aware of it, but you're already, your body and your brain have already kind of like hijacked your mind and said, pay attention to this. So people really didn't understand how this worked, but we do have a portion of our brain that is dedicated in terms of our visual system to movement that is separate from the conscious perception of vision, which means we go back to those pathways and there's going to be other pathways. In fact, over the course of physiological psychology, we're going to really go over three major pathways when it comes to, to vision. And when it comes to our perception of vision, there's going to be two of them we discussed today. Well, it was originally believed that this V1 was solely responsible for vision, and we know the occipital lobe receives the majority of the information from the eyes. And again, we see here in this image how these things are crossing, how you get information from here to here and here to here. But it's no longer <coughs> seen that way. And the reason is this. Some visual information is not sent to V1. So we think about the early mammalian brain. Right? What was that first mammal like? Well, the first mammal wasn't that different from the reptiles at the time. Right? We're talking uh, very olfactory centered. So scent is a big deal. We're talking vision is minor, right? And conscious visual processing is very low. Because in a lot of aspects, you don't need to have conscious visual processing in order to function, in order to see. You saw um, in Jurassic Park, in the movie Jurassic Park, before they mess it up with remakes, they had this kind of interesting thing where if you stand still, the dinosaurs can't see you, which is cute and it makes for a good story. But when we consider they probably had pretty fantastic sense of smell, standing still wouldn't matter. But there are things, for instance, that we know where, where movement does matter to, when it comes to function when it comes to the ability to feed. There are, you know, frogs and lizards that will only go after moving prey. If you were to put dead flies in front of that frog or paralyzed fries, flies, so there's still food, right? There's still at a level of nutrients and you stuck in front of the frog, it wouldn't eat them because its whole process, its whole cognition in terms of, you know, how it, how it feeds requires movement. So we have this separate system, this old system that runs not to the occipital lobe, but that bypasses the thalamus and goes to what's called the superior colliculus. If you recall, the midbrain has two structures in it, uh, the in, well, more than two, but for our purposes here, the inferior and superior collicula, colliculi. The inferior colliculus is involved with aud auditory attention, and the superior colliculus is involved in visual attention basically drawing your attention to things, things that are biologically relevant, things that are surprising, things that might be dangerous. 
So you've got this system that's instead of going all the way to the occipital lobe, runs to your midbrain, right? and then to an area called MTV5. MT stands for medial temporal, and V5 stands for a delineation of the visual system. V1 is the occipital lobe, right, where information is first sent, and then it moves out of there throughout the brain, both up and down. It goes up into the parietal lobe for what we call the wear pathway, the dorsal pathway, up, where, where is something in space. And it goes down along the temporal lobe pathway called the what pathway. What is this? Can I name this tool? So you say, okay, here is my, my cup. Where is it in space in relation to me? And what is it called? That information is processed in different parts. So once my conscious visual perception center gets it, it then sends it out for greater processing. And so MTV5 is the same area, and you will sometimes hear about it referred to in these terms. <clears throat> now, let's compare blind sight to visual neglect, because there's another interesting process here. Well, sometimes you can have an intact occipital lobe. Remember that pathway going up, that dorsal, dorsal pathway going up to the parietal, and the ventral pathway going down to the temporal. Well, you can have a perfectly functioning occipital lobe, but you can have this neglect. And so what will happen is you'll lose half of things. And this is often involved in damage to the parietal lobe, right? The right parietal lobe, where everything over here goes away in terms of our visual perceptual neglect. People with this kind of condition may find themselves hugging walls, right? So it's not that they're shy, it's that they stand in a way where part of their visual perceptual system is now blocked because there's nothing there and people would startle them coming up on that size. You sense things, but you don't process it. So the main part of vision that we care about is our conscious visual perception because this is the biggest part. We talk about the vision, we talk about the occipital lobe. In fact, in 10 years, if you're thinking about parts of the brain, when you think of occipital lobe, you should think vision, right? That's the first thing that comes to mind. When you think of the visual processing, hopefully you remember the pathway where you have the left and right hemisphere information cross at the optic chiasm, you go to the lateral geniculum nucleus in your thalamus, and then the occipital lobe. But these are the biggest pieces. So we've got what? The fovea, we see here, it's the center of our visual um, visual area, highest concentration of our, what we call, cones. So in terms of our conscious vision, it's doing the heavy lifting, the majority of the work. We've got these photoreceptors, which detect light. We've got these bipolar cells that are kind of like an interprocessing, like a processing unit, and our ganglion cells, and another couple more layers within there. Now we look at the eye. And what we see here is very clearly we have our um, this vitreous humor, this this kind of space with blood vessels. The parts of processing here that are interesting to us are right along the back of the eye, right? You see that kind of like yellow area along the back, the very surface of that being our photoreceptors and associated processing units. The lens, the pupil, these are interesting but they're not what we're looking at. They're not that part that does the actual visual sensory processing. Now, we also have what's called a blind spot. And your blind spot is where your uh, information leads your eye. So let's take a look at how, how this works, right? And we'll kind of come back to what that means in terms of our blind spot, because that sounds a little like an odd thing in terms of visual perception, but there's a part of your eye that doesn't have any photoreceptors and we kind of ignore it. You know, you don't notice that you have like these like missing pieces of information in your visual system. There's another big concept here when we think about this that involves the blind spot and why we have it, and it's this. The direction of light is coming from the left of the image to the right. <clears throat> and at the very back here, we've got our rods and cones, right? So 
um, the light direction is the, the lens of the eye, right, coming through. And then you go across your bipolar or your ganglion cell layers, your bipolar cells, and then you get to your photoreceptors, which is actually weird. If you were going to design an eye, you would not design the human eye. The human eye is backwards. Think about it. You want to create a, uh, a robot, right, that detects light. You put the receptors on the surface, basically. You don't put the receptors behind things and block them. What this means is before the light gets to our photoreceptors, it has to pass through layers of other neurons and blood vessels, scattering the light and making it more difficult to process. Again, this sounds odd. Well, there is a fascinating example here of what we call convergent evolution and divergent evolution. So what we have on the left is your eye. And then next to that is uh, what's called a cephalopod eye, like an octopus. Now you will notice the front part of the eye looks very similar, right? The, the lens, the way that you kind of see is really similar because it's a good kind of uh, adaptation. Now the back, however, is backwards. So in the human eye, at the very back, you have this layer, you know, where it says, uh, you know, one, your retina is at the back, right? And so the light has to come into your eye and pass through the layers of ganglion cells and blood vessels and um, bipolar cells. And then you've got these endocrine and horizontal cells that are in front of your visual receptors. Cephalopod eye does not work that way. In the eye of an octopus, the light immediately hits the photoreceptors, then goes back, okay? Then goes back to your to their processing. So think about how that's reversed. There's nothing in the way of the photoreceptors for an octopus, but for you, there's something in the way. And so what happened was, and this is the belief, because there's like, you know, flatworms, for instance, that have like an early eye structure, for instance, that has um, just, they sense light and dark. So as the eye develops, the first thing that develops are these pigmented cells that can detect light or dark. And they give you information about day or night. As the eye then develops, well, it can develop in different ways. All vertebrates share an eye like ours. It's backwards because you started developing these layers of processing cells on top. And then eventually it had dived back to get to the brain. Right? Eventually you needed more processing and you end up having to build up, up, and then these ganglion cell axons are going to come together and come back through the eye. And that's why you have a blind spot. Octopus, no blind spot. Because their whole uh, retina is covered with photoreceptors. But where ours leave the eye, you can't have any photoreceptors. So that's the idea here, right? And that's the structure of the visual system. And that's probably one of the harder things to think about and kind of like wrap your head around. Like, why do we have this blind spot? And if you have never found your blind spot, go do it. Hit pause, come back later, and do the test where you can actually see there's a hole in your vision. But you can only see it when you look for it, when you very carefully find a test for it. And the reason for that is we have all these layers of processing that allow us to it's really cool why it works that way. So now we look at, okay, we've got our photoreceptors, bipolar cells, and ganglion cells. And what we're looking at here, first, under ganglion cells, we see what it actually looks like. And then the other image shows us more, kind of like an artistic rendition, a little easier to understand. So light comes in, right? So the top of this image represents the back of your eye. The bottom of this image represents you know, the, the more forward part. So light comes in, passes your ganglion cells, your bipolar cells, and hits your photoreceptors. And we have two types of photoreceptors. Two classes, I should say. You have your um, rods and you have your cones. Rods are sensitive only to light and dark. Cones are sensitive to color. So what happens is light hits your rods and cones and then is processed by bipolar cells. 
more processed by ganglion cells and then goes to your thalamus, right? Crosses to the optic chiasm then goes to your thalamus. So we think about what's this processing happening? That's gonna be a big component of visual system and visual perception is that you have what we call early visual processing, which is kind of like the, the first stuff that's happening in the eye. Now, most of us have three cones, three types of cones, right? That are sensitive to red, green, and blue light primarily. You think about primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, that's for pigments. For light, mixing light, it's RGB. Well, that's great. That's exactly like your monitors. That's exactly like you know your, your projectors. And the reason they're like that is RGB. That's what we perceive. So everything is a mix of these colors. Now, what's also interesting about this is there are people who are missing uh, maybe one of these cones, and their visual perception looks different. So we're kind of going to get into how that works and color blindness and how different things are perceived. But the idea is you have these different receptors. So we'll kind of get into how these work. Well, basically, this is a complicated process. It's actually a metabotropic process. It's not ionotropic. Most of your senses work through ionotropic processes, right? Uh, taste and smell don't necessarily, but your um, mechanical senses like your hearing and your sense of uh, senses of touch are ionotropic. Open up an ion channel, cause a neuron to fire. Vision requires a second messenger as part of a metabotropic process. It's slow. So what you end up doing is you're converting a photon, right, which is a light, into a neural signal. And it turns this 11 cis retinol, which is sensitive to the photons, into all trans retinol, which causes hyperpolarization of the cell. It's inhibitory. What this means is our visual system works in a wildly kind of like counterintuitive way. Light hits your photoreceptors. It causes inhibition. And then your visual system picks up this inhibition, meaning, oh, there's something there. Right? So you kind of are always kind of like firing. You stop firing. You're like, oh, there's something there. Right? And that goes back to when we talked about how neurons fire and how some are excitatory and some are inhibitory and how this sounds, in a way, counterintuitive. But it's also really cool that it works that way. So we also have, in addition to these, uh, these receptors, in addition to our photoreceptors, bipolar cells, and ganglion cells, we have these other layers of cells that do other things. Again, early visual processing to start our perception as we go through. Horizontal cells, basically connected to both our bipolar cells and our photoreceptors, you have horizontal cells. These are helping us to deal with incoming information. Remember, we've got light that's getting scattered. It's passing through the optic nerve, right? It's passing through all these things in order to get to our photoreceptors. So we need to be able to tune and perceive. So for instance, as illumination changes, your photoreceptors are going to help you adapt. This is an incredible ability we have. You ever gone from like a, a bright, sunny day at the beach into a restaurant and it's like super dark, you can hardly see, and then within maybe a few minutes you've adapted to it. We're talking orders of magnitude of adaptation in perception. All right, it's not like just our pupil getting larger and smaller, right, to, to process light. We're also tuning our visual system to deal with illumination changes. Between our bipolar and our ganglion cells, you have a layer of amacrine cells. And these help to create what we call visual field subunits. So we're already starting to detect motion and increase sensitivity, basically tuning our perception before we get to the brain, which is why we talk about the eye as basically being brain. You got neurons in your eye that are doing the work of the brain in the same way your spinal cord is doing the work, right, that, that neurons in your brain would also be doing. Now, we also see the assist in circadian rhythm. And this has to do with that other pathway. And we'll kind of like get to that. But there's basically, if there's light, we're awake. If there's no light, we get tired. And so this is part of that process there. 
but we're seeing our bipolar and ganglion cells are starting to chop the world up into visual subunits. What we also see here is there's us, us, I have a little note on the slide about an error in the image, and it's kind of interesting to consider. The idea is this, it doesn't, the image isn't necessarily wrong, but it kind of misstates. So we see that the green ones represent cones at the bottom here, and the blue ones represent rods. Okay, and the green ones look like cones, and for those of you who are colorblind, and the blue ones look like rods for, you know, cones almost, you know, they tend to have their own bipolar cell and their own ganglion cell, which means your cone has, a, you know, connective uh, direct functional unit, cone, bipolar cell, ganglion cell, brain. And the reason is your cones, while in the minority in your retina, do the majority of the heavy lifting. They do the majority of the processing. So they need a direct line. Your, bi uh, your rods, you're more about sensitivity than precision. You care more about, is there something there? Rods are incredibly sensitive. Basically, a single photon will let a rod know, hey, there's light here. And cones need a lot of light in order to function. So your rods don't need a lot of light. Well, your cones do. And so your rods are going to function differently. And so you want to have these bigger subunits because you want to get a general idea of there's movement or change over here. You see, our visual system works on movement and change. If you want to see this, find a point on a blank wall, right, and stare at it. Stare at it for 15 minutes. You're going to start to hallucinate. Don't look away. Just look at the same spot. You can blink, but look at the same spot. And what happens is you stop updating the information around your field of vision. So out here, things get really weird. Right. Your peripheral vision, basically, we think of our periphery as being like kind of way out to the side. It's actually right around the center, right? Um, uh, the center of our field of vision we already pay attention to. And another way to look at that is look at one of the letters here. So look at the word detection right above, you know, on this slide. Look at the C in the middle of detection. And then tell me, without looking away from the C, how much of the rest of this can you read? Right? How far away can you actually perceive with any precision? Well, the precision is the center of your field of vision, and we see how small that window is in terms of that. Now, there are cases where rods may share or cones may share, but generally that's not what we're going to be thinking about. Our bipolar cells, uh, especially when it comes to rods we're talking about here, have these receptive fields, which means... You've got one bipolar cell. So let's just take a look at one of these circles where you have the blue on the outside and the yellow on the inside. Behind this are a bunch of bipolar cells. Okay. And so what we're looking at is the idea of a receptive field. So you've got behind this, um, I'm sorry, not a bunch of bi bipolar cells, a bunch of rods. So this bipolar cell behind here has a bunch of rods. And if you're in the center, your rod is saying that, you know, you're in the center. If you're on the periphery, the rod is saying you're on the periphery. This bipolar cell is able to detect which of these rods are functioning. This is the idea of a receptive field. So for at the top, on the left, we have an on-center cell, and on the right, we have an off-center cell. So where does the light hit? Well, when light hits the center, boom, there's something happening here. When light hits the outside, on the on-center cell, it doesn't fire. It's like there's nothing here. You do the whole thing, doesn't fire. You do the whole thing light, fires a little. What this does, and again, this is one of those, I think, more complicated concepts when it comes to vision. What this means is receptive fields. All through your visual, you know, system, you have these little receptive fields that help us start to chop up the world. We start with photoreceptors, rods and cones pixels, if you will, right? They're just sensitive to, is there light here or is there light of this color here if you're a cone? As you come out, you start to say, what's in this area? What's in this area? What's there? You have overlapping areas. But you start to say, is there change here? Is there something happening here? And you build up these receptive fields. And our bipolar cells generally have these on-center, off-surround receptive fields 
to tell us, is there something here? Because eventually we need to go from pixels to, to faces, right? To, to structures, to the environment. We need to go from these little tiny pieces, right? Where you have millions of these little tiny pieces and put it together into something like, here's an eye, here's a hand, here's a face, here's a tree. Ganglion cells give us even a larger chunk, and we'll look at kind of how that works in terms of our pathways. But we end up with, you know, forming the optic nerve, taking information from our bipolar cells, creating even larger visual fields, forming the optic nerve, cranial nerve 2, diving back through the retina, crossing at the optic chiasm and going to our thalamus. And along these ganglion, you know, along these pathways, you have two major pieces of information. You have magnocellular cells and parvocellular cells. Magnocellular, large, parvocellular, small. And magnocellular is generally processing many rods. And parvocellular ganglion cells are generally processing a single cone. Remember your cone, red, green, and blue, gets its own bipolar cell, its own rod or cone. Its own ganglion cell, excuse me. Your cones share bipolar cell, share a... Uh, ganglion cell. <clears throat> okay. Which of these contain opsins and can detect either red, blue, or green? Horizontal cells, amicron cells, rods, or cones? And the answer is these are your cones. Which of these is sensitive to illumination changes? Horizontal cells, amacrine cells, rods, or cones? The answer here, particularly what helps us with illumination, is horizontal cells. We call our horizontal cells being close, kind of that layer between our photoreceptors, our rods and cones, and our bipolar cells. When light enters the retina, it first passes by rods, cones, bipolar cells, or ganglion cells. When it enters the retina from the lens, through into the, you know, your, uh, to the back of the eye. So what does it pass through first? And the answer is ganglion cells. Your ganglion cell layer is closest to the surface of your eye. Your photoreceptors are behind it. And they're all right on the back. It's not like you have ganglion cells like hanging out behind the lens, right? If you've ever had your eyes checked and they see the blood vessels in there, that, you know, in, in the obvious humor, you can't see the photoreceptors and the ganglion cells are all the way along the back. You can see, you, they can point it out if you ever get the image taken. You should be able to see like your fovea. Um, they call the, they usually refer to the macula when they're talking about the structure of the eye, which is almost the same, but not quite. All right, two major visual pathways. Now we think about this and it's going to make sense to us because we've got two major types of ganglion cells, parvo cells and magna cells. Well, your visual, your conscious perception of vision is your geniculostriate pathway. Geniculostriate is actually a pretty, it's actually a descriptive term, and it's going to help us to understand this. So historically, the occipital lobe has also been called the striate cortex, and geniculo is part of the thalamus. The tectopulvenor is the automatic perception reflex, and this is the pathway that's going to go basically to your brainstem and midbrain. Well, let's look at these pathways. The geniculostriate pathway goes directly to V1, right? Well, not directly. You have to cross your optic chiasm. You have to go, and it, just a, an anatomical point that's going to help us eventually. Your optic chiasm is basically right by, right below your hypothalamus and that's going to matter for us as we go along so light is traveling very close to your hypothalamus the light information geniculo comes from lateral geniculo nucleus the nucleus in the thalamus that is responsible for visual information and striate comes from the word striped right the, the means striped and it comes from the v1 which has been called the striate cortex recall broadman areas recall uh Laminae, right? The layers of the cortex. It's specifically the occipital lobe that looks the most layered. The thalamus has similar receptive fields to the retina because it's getting the ganglion cell outputs from the retina. And you've got in here your P cells, M cells, and K cells. 
So you have P cells, they do color, your conscious perception, parvo cells, right, like that. You have M cells, magno cells, they do coarse patterns. And then your K cells, K cells get a bunch of information, but they also go directly to MTV5. So they might uh, be actually giving us that specific non-conscious perception of vision. And those are throughout the pathway. We can actually see layers in the thalamus too. There's usually basically a layer of M cells, P cells on each thalamus and each thalamus processing the opposite side. Now the tectopulvinar pathway is mostly your M cells. It sends information to the uh, superior colliculus. This is where you notice motion out of the corner of your eye. You know, a, a fly comes flying up here and you're like, whip your head like that. You're, someone's throwing a ball nearby and it comes close to you and you're actually able to pull your head away before it hits you, before you're consciously aware of it. It's protective in that way, right? Where we're able to kind of prepare for things. So thalamus is doing head movements, the brainstem is doing eye movements and it's helping to do this. So these are basically we think of as unconscious processes, unconscious motion perception. And when we think about, we go back to the beginning, we say, what happened with these patients who had blind sight? Well, this is where it's happening. The image here, uh, the blue part of the gray image is the superior colliculus, part of the midbrain. And it's helping us to kind of like switch our visual attention and switching and sending information along this pathway to MTV5, the medial temporal area of the brain that does visual perception. And so we have this unconscious visual pathway that's protecting us, that's allowing us to perceive this. As long as your retina, as long as your visual system is intact, your sensory system, you've got early visual processing happening in your eye, right? You've got your bipolar and ganglion cells that are processing this information. You could have your occipital lobe severely damaged Right, the uh, Riddix patients might have, you know, a bullet, you know, get hit with a shell or a bullet, tear out their occipital lobe. They're still surviving, they're still functioning, but they can't see anything. But they can still detect movement because that doesn't require a functioning occipital lobe. Again, kind of separating this. Well, here's our primary visual cortex. We got looking at V1, V2, and V3, where you have the yellow being V1, the orange being V2, and the blue V. V3. What we see are different types of cells, simple cells, complex cells, and hypercomplex cells. The idea is, remember, in your eye, you're starting to chop up the visual world. Your bipolar cells, on-center, off-surround, off-center, on-surround. Well, let's go back into the occipital lobe and see that we're going to continue to do levels of processing. You don't just go, it's actually really well understood how this works. You don't just go from pixels to faces. You go from pixels to receptive fields, to lines, to movement, to change, and you start to get more complex things. Then you get basic features, and then eventually you get to your FFA, your fusiform face area, and you get your faces. So let's take a look. Here's our primary visual cortex simple cells. The highest activity is for a line at a preferred orientation. So what this means is in these cells, and they can actually test this by putting electrodes into animal brains and showing them things at different orientations, and you can see this activity. So here's a line that's running uh, across this visual field. And the idea is the highest activity is along the line. As you shift it, you still get activity, but not a lot. And then the further away you get, the less activity you get. This helps us understand where the lines are, which should make sense. You see lines everywhere, pieces of lines. Everything is pieces of lines, right? You're, you know, I'm looking at a monitor, right? And I've got lines. I've got the, the outline of it. My glasses have these lines, right? My eyes have lines, my face. It's all these lines that are of different orientations. And this is what we're perceiving. As we go from our simple cells in the yellow to our complex cells, we've got moving lines. So now we have a line where, yeah, we care about the line, but what we really care about is movement of that line, right? So it's not like the line is moving. The line represents maybe the, uh, you know, my hand is moving up. The line maybe represents the edge of my hand. So if my hand moves up, it's like, ah, oh, there's movement here. 
this cell, it can't tell you what it is, but it can tell you there's movement here. And remember with blind sight, it's a very different kind of movement here. Blind sight is, I, uh, they're not aware that they're seeing, but they're able to detect. So when they test this, they might show something moving and they're like, did you see something move? And they're like, no, I'm blind. Why are you being a jerk? Right? So you say, well, if you had to guess, what direction do you think it moved? And they're like, ah, oh, this direction. Right? And they're right most of the time, which is obviously something's happening. They can even do things like if you go like this, you can kind of like do a swirl motion and say, did you see movement? And they're like, no. And you say, well, guess, and they'll do this. So they're basically able to detect it. This is different. This is the primary visual cortex where you're actually starting to put together bigger conscious perceptions. You say, yeah, I saw movement. Maybe if you remember where they were. Your hypercomplex cells, V3, the blue area, now you've got movement with a boundary. So the line is moving, but you've also got a cutoff, right? Because now we've got bigger pieces. Where in my visual field are things moving? Where are we perceiving things, right? This is your hypercomplex cell. So they get excited by movement, and then they get inhibited when you cross this part, which tells you there's a boundary of this cell. This cell is no longer processing that movement. There is movement that has gone past this point, which again, helps us to build up to our bigger visual perceptions. Right? Visual perception has been and you know, one of the most studied things because of how much we are dedicated to it, how visual we humans are. How are we doing? These are sensitive to coarse patterns. Rods, cones, M cells, or P cells. And remember the answer here is R M cells. M cells being in our thalamus and putting information together from a bunch of um, a bunch of rods and a bunch of bipolar cells, which is primarily concerned with motion detection, magnocellular, parvocellular, tectopulvinar, geniculostriate. This one's a little more interesting because the answer is tectopulvinar. Now, tectopulvinar is using magna cells, right? But is the part that actually is like there's movement here. The blind sight people are able to do this. Now the geniculus stride can do motion too. We just saw moving lines, but this is the conscious perception and it does all these other things. So I could see you guessing magnocellular tectopulvinar geniculus stride, but very clearly tectopulvinar is the best answer. And I think I just answered this, which is primarily concerned with the conscious perception of vision. And the answer here is geniculostriate. How we perceive vision is also looked at in another way. So we start with theories of visual perception. We're going to talk about these things, how these things work, right? Basically how we put things together. Well, the older theories are trichromatic and opponent process. So let's go through these and we see these, you know, the tuning frequencies of our rods and cones. So before we go on, let's look at what this means. The red line represents a, uh, a cone's visual perception tuning. And this is L, M, and S represent long, medium, and short, right? So long and short frequency. Blue is a short frequency, right? 400 nanometer space between peaks, right? So short, like more peaks. L is a longer frequency, close to 700 nanometers between peaks. So here's your 400 blue, here's your 700, your 700 red. Your blue is like this, very close together. Your red is a little bit wider like this. So that's how, you know, light is both a particle and a wave. Take physics, I'm not going to go into it. But that's the idea, right? Now, this means that as light comes in, and let's get into trichromatic theory, this is at the level of photoreceptors, and as light comes in, something that is a, a color is going to affect things differently. So my shirt has blue in it. The blue part here is going to mostly affect this blue cone. But you notice there's some overlap with red and green. So there's different kind of layers of blue, so we're putting these things together. I'm not going to tell you that my blue is the same as your blue, because I have no idea what that question even means. But we do perceive... We, we all perceive who have our three photoreceptors. We have a 
a rainbow of these things. Um, so trichromatic theory helps us to understand things like color blindness. So what happens if someone's colorblind? How do we mix things together? People who are colorblind aren't blind to all color. They gen most of them. Most people who are colorblind are missing a single uh, cone type. And it's usually, you know, because red and green are so close together, red-green colorblindness is the most common because the symptoms are extremely similar. The perception is extremely similar. So let's look at the green cone and try to understand how this works. Let's say you have no red, no long wavelength cones. Well, if light comes in right at right in the middle, you, you are getting a strong green signal, the strongest. But as you shift left and right, you notice here's, let's say, 570 nanometers is hit and green here, right? And hit and green here, you're at 480, 490 nanometers. So there's two different wavelengths, both affecting the green cone in the same way. When you're hitting the middle, the green cone is firing very fast. But as you go down the left and the right sides, firing slows down. The idea is the further you are from the center of that peak, from that 534 nanometers, the slower you are in firing. And it slows as you go up 10 and as you go down 10. So 524 and 544 are perceived the same way by the green cone. Now that's not a problem because it overlaps with the red cone. And if you're here, if you're at 544, you're hitting the red cone here. If you're at 524, you're hitting the red cone here. So your brain is able to take how much is my red cone firing, how much is my green cone firing, how much is my blue cone firing, and figure out what the color is. You lose a cone, and you lose that precision. You lose the signs in that regard. That's why you see people who, you know, red and green things might look similar, but it depends on the frequency, right? It depends on how far you are from the center. And if you're missing the red, well, that means you're still getting the blue, right? So it's only right around the center here we have trouble, and at the very high edge. So it's not like you're missing the whole thing. But we can get an idea of how people perceive things if they're colorblind. So consider. Only 92% of the population has normal vision. And the two um, red, green, colorblind, the first two here, you've got different things happening. So you have people that either have a missing or a mutated thing. So we'll just focus on these. Um, you can also be missing uh, all of your cones, and it's rare. And then their visual spectrum looks like this. <clears throat> so you'll notice these first two here, where they have an anonymous protein, they have are very similar. And that's red and that's green cones that have this mutation. So that's what colorblindness looks like. They're not blind, but their rainbow looks different. That's the idea. Here's the full range. And then as we kind of see, we see these differences here. Colorblindness is common. Total colorblindness is extremely rare. And many people might not even be aware because they function fine. We tend to think that people perceive the world we do. Look at tetrachromats. Tetrachromats actually have an additional cone. They have a fourth type of photoreceptor, right, for cones. Not the three that most of us have. This is only possible in women because it's X-linked, X-chromosome-linked. So you have to basically have two slightly different shifted versions of one of your red or green <clears throat> cones and you end up with a different rainbow. I can't even show you what it looks like. And I can't show you what it looks like because I can't see it. And our RG, RGB monitor can only mix three colors. So we can't even show you. And just like colorblind people, tetrachromats might not even know that they see things differently. I've seen the numbers range here from small all the way up to 25%. Of, of women, which again, I, it's hard to measure, and I think we need more, more research into it. Um, 
The next one is the opponent process theory. This is the level of bipolar and ganglion cells. So trichromatic theory, it was discovered by, you know, Hemholtz in the 1800s. He figured out that there were different colors absorbed by these, by these uh, cones. Opponent process, people started to ask, well, what, how do after images work? How do negative works? And so the idea is we have this continuum of these three opposites, red, green, blue, yellow, and black, white. So we end up having a bi bipolar cells that are getting information from our rods, from our cones that are kind of tuning toward a continuum. We have po impossible colors and we have after image. So I'll just show you this for a moment. If you were to stare at the center of this image and you were to um, uh, stare at the, this little white dot, the very center of the face for 30 seconds, and then look at a blank screen, you will see what's called an after image. The idea is you're fatiguing the, one of these colors, so the opposite then stands out. And as I now look at the blank area and blink, I see a face. I think an easier way to see this is to get something red and something green. You take the thing that's red, and you cover one eye, and you stare at it. You stare at the red thing for as long as you can, for at least 30 seconds to a minute, you stare. Then you grab the green thing, and very quickly you drop the red thing and hold the green thing in front of your eye. And then you go back and forth between each eye. You open your left eye, you open your right eye. The eye that was closed is seeing that green, typically. The eye that was open is seeing an impossible color that can only exist when you fatigued your red photoreceptors, right, your red cones. This tells us that red and green are working together. It's almost like a continuum from red to green and a continuum from yellow to blue. Retinex theory is retina plus cortex. And so it's the level of a cortex. And it's the best way to think about it is we know that you're wearing the same things even when the lights turn on and turn off, right? You go from a, a dim room to a bright room. We, we see this color, what we call color constancy, right? Where things are the same. You know, there's been no change. It's not like, oh my goodness, the, it's brighter in here. Did you just change your clothes? No, it no, doesn't work that way. <clears throat> then we look at this image here, which is the checker, checker shadow illusion. So you see squares A and B. They're the same color. Not the letters, the squares. Now, A to me looks like dark gray and B looks like light gray, right? And I'm assuming it looks that way to you. But if you were to take this image, print it out, cut out the squares, hold them next to each other, they're the same color. They're the same color, the same shade of gray. And if you don't believe me, that's fine. I want you to prove me wrong. I want you to go and I want you to do it. And the reason is, this is fascinating. Illusions tell us a lot about the way the visual system works here. It's how we're kind of taking our knowledge basically top-down versus bottom-up processing, how we're taking our knowledge of shadow and color and calculating these things. We use the surrounding information in order to calculate these colors. So go ahead, take a look at it. The shade of the A square and the shade of the B square are the same square, same shade. Now let's consider our visual pathways, dorsal and ventral. I mentioned this early on. Dorsal, ventral. Dorsal is a prior of the where pathway. It's spatial information. Where is something in space, right? So you say, okay, here's my classes. <clears throat> what are these and where are they? The what information is processed temporarily. The where information is processed priorally. Now, motion perception. <clears throat> Let's look here. Now, here we finally put it all together. We got a V1. We got all the V areas stretching out from their higher levels. And we've got this MTV5. MTV5 is getting information directly from our midbrain, right, our technopulmonary pathway. But it's also getting information from our conscious perception. It's all integrating so that we can put together a complete understanding of what we're seeing. <clears throat> Echinotopsia is the inability to see motion. So what, well, this is another thing we kind of like assume. Well, this would be damage to MTV5. People 
people might have this. So some can see no motion at all. Some can see change, can see no change due to motion. We think about how we put things together. When you watch a movie, you're watching a bunch of individual frames, but we're creating a seamless experience. When you see the world, in a way it's similar, right? If I were to close, if I were to turn my head and look from the camera to the other side of the room, right? My visual system actually stops sending blood, right? It stops processing information until my head is done turning, right? And then it fills in the blanks with where my eyes move, right? I go from here, go from here to here, right? I'm not, there's nothing in between. I'm filling in the blanks afterwards. We are putting together movement, putting together these pieces. And not being able to see this might be like seeing, if you've ever been to a, a club or, a, or somewhere where they have a strobe light, right? And you see the light turning on and off, and it's pitch black, bright, and everything kind of looks jittery. It could appear that way. You could have somebody, for instance, um, who regularly overflows the, the, uh, a glass because they can't see the change to the motion. So all these pieces go together. We started with blind sight. We started with movement. And we end there too, right? Our visual system is doing all of these tasks as we put things together. And this is incredibly complicated. So please make sure you understand how bipolar cells work, how you're dealing with red and green as a continuum, how we're dealing with our pathways. There's a lot of information, but it's fascinating because we spend so much of our time processing our visual things. Thank you and have a good afternoon.